when you look at now <clears throat> what is about to happen, in the first read it sounds rather cryptic. Rather cryptic meaning that it simply sounds like a series of negations that are about to come. But prior to that, what Shariputra, what Avalokiteshwara is trying to clarify to Shariputra in terms of practice is primarily a negation of things that we sometimes even hold dear to ourselves. Hold dear to ourselves meaning that there are often times that we can negate a lot of things in our lives. And by negation I mean that we are willing to give up, we are willing to renounce and so on. But nonetheless, we have difficulty engaging in this complete sort of renunciation of things, complete negation of things. And here, then Avalokiteshwara is suggesting to Shariputra. And in the first part, the profundity of the sutra comes up. And he says that... Uh, Rupan Pratak Shunita Shunyata and Pratakrupam Yadrupam Sa Shunita Shunita Tadrupam. So here, firstly, the conversation is happening upon form and formlessness. But formlessness here oftentimes equated with this notion of emptiness because what Avrukiteshura, as in through Buddha, Buddha through Avalokiteshwara is suggesting that form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Form is no other than emptiness, and emptiness is no other than form. And people hear that and they freak out. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Form is no other than emptiness, emptiness is no other than form. That this idea, I mean, at one level, when you look at it, it's, it simply becomes oftentimes for people a statement of analysis. A statement of analysis meaning that perhaps it is simply referring to the idea that all things are bereft of intrinsic existence. I'm sure you have heard this many times um, uh, in, in, in Madhavika commentaries. But when perfection of wisdom is trying to what it is trying to point to is something much more profound than that, which is that it is because of emptiness that form can actually exist. That in the absence of emptiness, there will actually be no form. That the idea that space allows for matter to exist, the idea that because of emptiness, form exists. So it's not sort of this deconstructive thinking that I'm going to try to dismantle form and then bring it down to the level of emptiness. But it's this understanding that whatever I see, whatever I experience exists because emptiness exists. Because emptiness allows the possibility for things to exist. That's sort of one of the most profound um, teachings, insights, experience in all of Buddha Dharma. <clears throat> to recognize that form exists because emptiness exists. And the second part of it, to recognize that they are in certain ways indistinguishable. That form is no other than emptiness and emptiness is no other than form. That oftentimes when we think of form, we are thinking of I'm going to build something up, see, which would be different than the emptiness surrounding it. And what Pragya Bharamita is suggesting is all things are truly empty. Whether you try to come to it from a, a deconstructing, deconstructive analysis or having a direct insight, a protection of all things being empty. And that 
is the state of emptiness that truly is real. Rest everything is a construct of one form or the other. And where there is emptiness, there is form. <coughs> that emptiness gives rise to the possibility for form to exist and so on. Then comes again a series of negations. Negations in terms of the negation of the five, sense aggreg uh, five aggregates, the negation of the senses, the negation of corresponding objects of the senses and so on. And what is this fascination with negation? The fascination with negation is that unless and until one is able to train one's mind <coughs> to understand negation, the mind is prone to give rise to grasping. The mind is prone to give rise to grasping because the mind is so deeply steeped and so familiar, so habituated with any form of grasping. And even when one becomes somewhat accomplished in the idea of renunciation, it finds something else to grasp to. You take a simple thing, for example, the preference of the mind at any point to say, I prefer spiritual life than non-spiritual life. Now, in my mind, I've already created a separation between what is spiritual, what is non-spiritual. And as the mind is going through that process, it begins to categorically discriminate objects. Discriminate objects in terms of this is of spiritual nature, this is of non-spiritual nature. But it hasn't conditioned itself in how it should relate to objects that are of spiritual nature. So it relates in the same way as it has related to objects of non-spiritual nature. Meaning that all I have done is shifted my mundane objects of grasping with sacred objects of grasping. And I think it's progress. I think it's progress. Why? Because it's a superior form of grasping. It's holy grasping. As opposed to the unholy grasping that other people grasp towards. So already, you see, the mind has created this kind of discrimination. And as one progresses, this holy grasping then becomes more and more strong. Why? Because now, this holy grasping keeps getting validated by your idea that there's nothing wrong with this form of grasping. Why? Because it is spiritual in nature, it is holy, people endorse that, as in holy people endorse. And what happens is, then we actually never look at the mechanics of grasping itself, which is why suffering and ignorance was there in the first place. So all we have done successfully is managed to change our objects of grasping without looking at how this grasping evolves, what is the nature of grasping, and what has changed, what has shifted in my ability to grasp and renounce whether I choose mundane life or so-called mundane life and so-called spiritual life and so on. So, engaging in this practice of negation, what it allows one to do is actually understand to its core the mechanic of grasping itself. Why is it that the mind actually discriminates? What part of actually my mind sees something as holy or unholy, sacred or profane, to be desired and not to be desired? Because Buddhism doesn't tell you just to be cautious of your, of your aversions, it tells you also to be cautious of your attachments and vice versa. That if the way to nirvana was just to have aversion towards samsara, it would have been a very easy path. We would have told you this is how you develop aversion to samsara. But no, 
You develop aversion to samsara and that is just step one. Why? Because aversion to samsara is a bait to get you towards dharma. But if you have continued aversion to samsara, that is not going to take you anywhere. Why? Because the mechanics of aversion is something that needs to be shattered, just like the mechanics of attachment or grasping. So this process of negation now that comes up in Pragya Paramita, that's a constant reminder. To the point that even it even tells you then that you should not think of something as knowledge or lack of knowledge or end of knowledge. And you should not even think of goal and completion and, and things of this nature. And that's the point then again when you have the second freaking out moment. The second freaking out moment which is that what am I doing if the goal is not clear? If the goal is not clear of that I have to be enlightened and if I am to be enlightened then this should be the goal. This is what I should be striving towards. Meaning all my life the reason I have been successful is because I've set a goal and I have been striving towards it. Right? And again, that's the path or the habituation or the mechanic of doing things that the mind is familiar with. So how do you pursue a goalless goal? How do you pursue a goalless goal? And here, the reason that perfection of wisdom is trying to even shatter your any idea of God is because our mind, creative as it is, endowed with all forms of ability to imagine and conceptualize, will conceptualize anything. If I tell you emptiness, it doesn't shy away from conceptualizing emptiness. You will write poetry about it. You would say how profound emptiness is, how good emptiness is, how warm emptiness is, how this emptiness is actually filled with all the goodness in the world. <laughs> See, why? Because this mind is not content with taking emptiness for being empty. You know, that's why Chandrakirti, in his commentary, says, oh, stupid mind, recognize that emptiness is actually empty. <laughs> why? Because the mind has very difficult time not conceptualizing something no matter how profound it is, no matter how much the teachers, the masters, the text, the tradition tells you, don't try to imagine this. Just let it be. So then, this process of conceptualization begins and we want to conceptualize what emptiness is. I just told you, form is empty and emptiness is form. And we all said, well, that's profound. So now let me contemplate what the form of emptiness is. You see why? Because that must be the most superior form of form. It's like the form of all forms. That's emptiness. Meaning the mind is not content with seeking emptiness as it is. It must conceptualize. It tries to conceptualize. And so what Pragya Bharamita is doing is that it is constantly reminding us to deconceptualize to engage in an alternate form of learning, an alternate form of learning, which begins with unlearning. See, unlearning, meaning that not only unlearning things that we have learned in terms of the notions of samsara and so on, but unlearning the very mechanics of how the mind operates. See, unlearning to learn. Meaning that if you truly want to understand what perfection of wisdom is, we must unlearn all that we know about wisdom. Why? Because all that we know about wisdom is simply a conceptualization. It's simply a conceptualization of how we have thought about wisdom. How we have elaborated on wisdom. How we define wisdom. But we haven't really understood what wisdom is. So what perfection of wisdom does is that it tries to systematically shatter every possible conceivable thing that you can conceptualize about anything, including enlightenment. Meaning that, again, if you were to be told that enlightenment is your goal, that you don't want any, just any kind of enlightenment that an average 
joke in heaven. You want a profound enlightenment. So if you want profound enlightenment, what do you do? You start conceptualizing profound enlightenment. So even within Mahayana tradition, you say, okay, there are all kinds of enlightenment, right? They say, well, the highest enlightenment is not just Sambodhi, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. Now, the very adjectives should tell you that you should not try to conceptualize it. What is Anuttara? What is Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi? Meaning that something that doesn't have any boundaries, something that cannot be limited, something that cannot be characterized. But here I am thinking how beautiful this Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi might be. That if ordinary enlightenment looks like this way, then, you know, like if ordinary enlightenment is, you know, 400 watts of electricity, this thing must be like 40,000 watts. It should have all the dazzles. Yeah. So what happens now again? The process of conceptualization happens. And Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, of course, you know, they're compassionate. You know, they're ta they take pity on our this, this ability. So here, Pragya Paramita is constantly, systematically trying to tell you Stop, conceptual, stop conceptualization. You know, the very process is something that you have to give up. It's not that you're switching you know, bigger and better concepts for lesser concepts, but you're completely giving up just the mind's habitual tendency to conceptualize. To even conceptualize what emptiness is, what enlightenment is, and so on and so forth. This particular process is something that, again, I would urge you to think more deeply about, to reflect more deeply about, and understand, specifically in understanding how grasping occurs, and how most of our, most of our life, all we are doing is searching objects of grasping around. When I was 10 years old, my mind gravitated towards this thing. This was the most important thing in my life. When I was 15, this was the most important thing in my life. When I'm 20, this was the most important thing in my life. Right? <coughs> and there may be no correlations between these objects of grasping. But spiritual grasping is no different than ordinary grasping. Mind doesn't make that difference. It follows the same mechanic, mechanisms or the same cycles. So how to practice in a manner where the mind, over a period of time, does not engage in this process of conceptualization, but that you can truly actually get into the non-conceptual states, the non-conceptual aspects of your experiences. Then the sutra goes into... Uh, Importing this particular uh, mantra. So here it simply says that this mantra, as, as a preface to, to giving this mantra, it simply said that this mantra is something that you know, destroys ignorance and so on and so forth. And what is this mantra? So this mantra is. Uh, this mantra, such as it is, and it, as in Taddeta, Gade Gade Par Gade Par Sangate Bodhi Swa. So here, oftentimes, you know, people try to literally translate the mantra, which has its own limitations, you know, and as in, you know, gone, gone, gone beyond, and so on and so forth. So here, um, I mean, it's useful to know that. Uh, in terms of its meaning, but all it is saying is, you know, going from one stage to another stage to another stage in terms of partly through levels of conceptualization, is it? that how you actually shatter through to get to parasangade, as in completely gone beyond. So that's sort of one way of looking at this sutra. Is it? And then, of course, the sutra ends by finally Buddha you know, opening his eyes and then saying sadhu sadhu to Avalokiteshvara, meaning that he's endorsing everything that Avalokiteshvara has said in response to Shariputra.
So for this evening, I wanted to give this particular version of the commentary. There's a more traditional version of the commentary. The more traditional version is in which, you know, we'll talk about the five steps or the panch margas within the perfection of wisdom. Uh, starting with, you know, uh, how do you say, uh, like the, you know, path of accumulation, path of training, to going to the path of no more learning. So that's sort of the traditional strand of, of uh, uh, giving a commentary on the Hal Sutra. But since uh, last few months, I change my commentary every time I have an opportunity to change things. Uh, uh, so last at least few weeks, I have been, uh, I was doing retreat of a different form. So I was thinking, uh, or lack thereof, during the course of the retreat. Uh, and this was the insight that I actually wanted to share, which was this aspect of negation. That oftentimes, how easy it is for us to simply switch the object of attachment and congratulate ourselves. Um, and we should congratulate ourselves if the, the journey is from a very destructive object of attachment to a somewhat non-destructive object of attachment from very toxic object of attachment to somewhat non-toxic object of attachment, then you should congratulate yourself. That's, you see, a big jump, and that's progress. But, you see, toxicity has its own nature of things, and, and especially when we are talking about the process of grasping in spiritual life. Uh, that's something that we have to think a bit more carefully and discipline ourselves accordingly in a manner that how is it that my grasping in spiritual life is different from other grasping? Characteristically, why do I think that this grasping is better than other forms of grasping? Is it simply because I think these objects are more holier, higher than other objects? So this is something that I invite you to uh, reflect on and uh, then we'll probably have some other opportunity where I can give you a more traditional commentary <laughs> on, 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 on the perfection of wisdom. Um, and there are some beautiful commentaries of course written on the sutra over the years by, uh, by many many great teachers both in India and in Tibet and in other parts of the world as well. Um, so that's it. What else to say about that? Some question answers. Sure.